All right, you guys, uh, thank you for coming. This is a lot more people than we expected. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Professor Kebacheva here uh, at UCL. Uh, I will just say a couple of words uh, before I just let her do her thing. Um, I think it's an interesting comparison to talk about um, the politics of memory in Bulgaria from my perspective as someone who was born <laughs> after 1990, and then she can really go into much more detail. I'm born before 1990. <laughs> Slightly before that. <laughs> um, what's really interesting is that uh, in Bulgaria, there was a pretty important political protest in 2013 and 14, which is called Dance With Me. Um, and one of the most interesting things that happened is that this particular monument, which is the Soviet Army Monument in Sofia, was used as a pretty central place for the expression of political protest, where the plaques, which are on the side, were painted um, in solidarity of Ukraine, in solidarity um, of the uh, of the Prague Spring in in, um, in 1968, um, and what that showed was an extremely important diagnosis of how far the post-socialist society in Bulgaria has come after 1989. That even a protest which is initially against corruption, against the oligarchy and stuff, actually has very deep-seated notions about the legacy of communism in Bulgaria. But what is particularly important is when I went back and I interviewed people who are my age what they know about communism, what they know about the past, how they associate with this totalitarian history. It was shocking to me that they really didn't know and they didn't care. And even though this is a quite, obviously quite a dominant and phallic symbol in the, in the cityscape of Sofia, nobody actually questions it. Nobody knew where that gun is pointed. That gun is pointed to the West and it's not, you know, it's not without reason. And this, this has become so banal, so everyday, that it's just a place for sub, like, for youth cultures without actually acknowledging its totalitarian past. And the reason why I brought this up is to show that the young generation now are using this and um, interrogating it in a digital platform, not politically, but extremely artistically. And if you look at it, you can see that the monster which is standing behind it is not, is not real, it's digital. Yet, because the history of this monument is so contested and because it, it speaks to an official truth about, you know, a liberation in Bulgaria that never happened. The way that they're juxtaposed, you can actually question which one is more mythical and which one is actually the monster. The problem with this is that because it's just artistic and it doesn't interrogate the political past, you cannot know why this continues to be so central. And that's why the, the political process was so important because every time the plaques were painted, every time they were used as a, as a, as a form of political protest, they were, they were clean, they were, the messages were cleared, which is the most direct diagnosis of just how far we've come in terms of coming to terms with the past. Um, and I think that's why it's so important that Professor Kibalchev is here to talk about this because it's a, it's a subject that really needs further discussion. And I think Bulgaria is a very interesting example because it has a kind of post-socialism that is very different from Central Europe. Um, and so, without further ado, just a couple of words um, as a kind of introduction. Uh, I think Professor Kibachko is one of the most important historians 
um, on Bulgaria's recent history. And I think what she's doing in terms of trying to introduce Bulgaria's history after 45 in the in the in the history textbook um, and its place uh, for the for the post-socialist generation is very important because so far we have one official textbook, one official narrative about what's happened after 45, and it's it's a very contested one. And I think uh, it's a very important activity to present the other side and to to create a discussion. Um, obviously, uh, Professor Gavetta has a particularly anti-communist past. Uh, I, I have it in my notes here that while she was writing her dissertation, it was not allowed to be published for obvious ideological reasons. And after the fall of the regime, um, she went to America for seven years on a Fulbright scholarship, but uh, is one of the very few people that came back um, to kind of restart the conversation that was completely silenced after 89. Um, and so it's a, it's a great pleasure that she's here with us to talk about something that is extremely interesting and, and also very important. So uh, just a couple of claps if you, if you would like. Good evening. Thank you very much for being here with me. Um, the thing that I'm sorry about is that I cannot compete with anyone of you with uh, the beautiful British accent. Uh, but uh, I think that what um, we're here to share today and to discuss afterwards, um, it will be more important. So um, today I'm going actually to, I'm hoping to, to open a discussion after showing um, a uh, couple, not couple, around 120 photographs that I took all around Bulgaria, presenting the whole the um, uh, history of communist and post-communist monuments in Bulgaria, and to discuss here ahead of time um, all the paradoxes that those monuments, their fate, their status, their legal presence, all the discussions around them, and the carnivalization of those monuments we're going to see in a second, uh, brought um, uh, and stirred a, a fantastically interesting uh, uh, debate in Bulgaria. Let me start with uh, um, uh, violent, uh, from violence to freedom. This is how I see the, uh, the faith, the whole history of, uh, of those uh, monuments. Some call them fetish, some call them phallic symbols of uh, totalitarian regime. I simply, uh, I, I should open my uh, remarks here with uh, the statement that most of those uh, monuments that are all around Bulgaria and that still dominate um, the social milieu of the greatest, uh, the biggest uh, uh, cities in Bulgaria, uh, Sofia, Plovdiv, Ruse, Varna, etc., etc., are actually falsifications of history because the status given to them under the tremendous political um, um, <coughs> pressure coming from um, uh, the, Rus the Soviet and uh, afterwards from uh, Russian uh, diplomatic uh, agencies uh, in Bulgaria, um, uh, claim that those monuments are soldiers' monuments and they are not. Bulgaria was occupied by the Red Army, uh, but even today, if you approach some of those um, um, monuments, uh, wait, can I uh, start with it? Uh, yeah, you can just click it. Okay. Um, th this is the this is the first one opening um, uh, uh, the first uh, monument uh, in Varna, uh, which was destroyed because the figure and the uh, and the size were not uh, uh, grandiose enough, so the, uh, the, the monument was redone. And here you see the, uh, some of those. Let me only show you the, um, the inscription, which goes to... Um, how go, can I go down? Uh, the inscriptions of those monuments say, um, to the invincible uh, Soviet army, uh, by the grateful Bulgarian people. Uh, plus, they're treated officially, um, legally, as uh, soldiers' monuments, like those that are in Berlin or uh, Budapest or Vienna, <laughs> which are. Uh, and here, in this case, it's, um, uh, it's totally fake. Second, uh, the, we have another cases that are 
um, connected with the legal uh, uh, legal issues and their paradoxes. None of those monuments were uh, was ever um, uh, built on a place uh, where the ownership of the of the land or the place uh, was uh, actually legal. Um, there were no competitions for the uh, uh, or consensus among. Uh, among the for the uh, for those that are going to to build the monuments, um, as I, I mentioned already, the tremendous pressure coming from uh, uh, from the diplomatic uh, circles in uh, uh, United the Soviet Union and Russia, and today uh, we have a couple of um, of trials against street artists that are um, uh, actually transforming those monuments into some kind of uh, um, new um, uh, places, totally heterotopic uh, taste, uh, places according to the, um, uh, to the taxonomy of uh, Foucault. Um, and uh, in many uh, occasions, we have a tremendously uh, active, um, uh, sophisticated, funny and uh, timely response to some political events that are taking place not only in Bulgaria but also across Europe and especially commemorating some of the, of the events that took place uh, between 1945 and 1989. Uh, the second uh, uh, very important uh, uh, remark that I would like to, um, to, to start my, um, uh, my presentation is with uh, um, the, the aesthetic uh, um, issue, if you wish, because as everywhere uh, at that time, we have a clear totalitarian state, uh, um, uh, kind of propaganda, um, and uh, the whole uh, tremendous amount of resource that was put into building those gigantic uh, uh, complexes, memorial complexes all over uh, <laughs> Bulgaria. Um, were actually um, um, a clear cut um, totalitarian art. We know this very well from uh, the examples coming from uh, the Soviet Union, uh, almost the same style in, in Nazi uh, Germany, and um, one specific uh, uh, emphasis on the on the not only the expression, the the, the effect. Of the tridimensional uh, image on the uh, on the masses, and this kind of monumental propaganda was, uh, which was uh, uh, crucial for uh, for the regime. Um, the monuments also present some kind of a borderline, some kind of a turning point uh, after the establishment of the, of the regime in Bulgaria. Some also interpret uh, those monuments as um, a celebration of the victory over the, one of the. Um, of the first and very, uh, um, I would say, strong, active, uh, armed um, resistance against uh, the communist regime, uh, the so-called Guriani movement in Bulgaria, which until a couple of uh, years was totally unknown for, for the Bulgarian public and uh, is, the, is not part of the Bulgarian, uh, of the teaching of, of history. Uh, now, artists, street artists that are involved in uh, uh, transforming those um, those monuments are persecuted by uh, Bulgarian authorities. Uh, the leaders of the Bulgarian Communist slash Socialist Party asked uh, for even a death penalty for some of them. Um, the, prose the prosecutor in Sofia asked for 15 years in prison for um, just painting the faces and the bodies. We're going to see uh, them in a second. Um, now they're um, they're not so successful. Uh, and in terms of uh, the persecution, we'll see what, what will happen. Um, but in addition to, uh, to those paradoxes that stem from the uh, judicial issues, we, um, we see aesthetical paradoxes um, related to the monumental propaganda. Um, even those that created the, the monument, uh, 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 Lubomir Dalchev was among them, famous Bulgarian, uh, artist, sculptor, he defected to Bulgaria, to, to the United States uh, in, uh, in the 70s. He wrote, uh, uh, up until now, uh, a secretly kept uh, letter to the authorities in Bulgaria, saying that himself 
uh, he himself uh, uh, is not going to oppose the decision to um, dismantle the, uh, some, uh, some of those monuments because he said they are nothing but an expression, a symbol of one of the worst authoritarian <coughs> regimes that Bulgaria ever uh, suffered. Um, another thing that we're going to see everywhere is the presence, the, uh, the tremendously obvious and heavy presence of the bogey. Up, up until 1944-48, actually most of the monuments uh, like I, I mentioned came after uh, the political uh, repression was uh, um, uh, went to its uh, climax and all the uh, uh, political opposition opposition in Bulgaria was uh, um, destroyed. So they could be seen also as symbols of the victorious uh, Soviet uh, communist, uh, Soviet -style <coughs> communist regime. Um, but um, in terms of presence and uh, city milieu and aesthetic um, uh, value and um, uh, messages that are, are coming from those uh, uh, tremendously overwhelming uh, bodies, we see uh, a totally new uh, trend in Bulgarian art and in Bulgarian, uh, uh, if you wish, monumental uh, art. Uh, the body, the body is everywhere, and they're all the same. Uh, they're actually, um, um, of course, they're symbols. They're uh, um, all the same. They're imposing. Uh, you see. Um, uh, Gender-wise, uh, we always have the uh, a woman, and she is always one step behind the, the man. We have all kinds of arms, of course, Russian arms, etc. Et <laughs> so the body came in such a monstrous uh, volumes uh, uh, with the, the monumental propaganda of the communist regime. Uh, and finally, if you would like to, um, <coughs> uh, I would like to, to summarize those introduction in, in the introduction. Um, I would say that today we have some, the result of some kind of a very specific formation of a known memory. Because this is not a memory, this is not a living memory from the generations that uh, went through uh, the occupation of, by the Red Army, um, uh, the reparations that Bulgaria paid for this, that uh, 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 the resistance against the regime, uh, the horrible um, period of, uh, uh, of the Red Terror, um, it creates some kind of a totally artificial ideological uh, uh, cliché, which is still um, very well uh, preserved and guarded by uh, some of, of the old guards. Um, Nikolai mentioned that every time street artists and uh, political activists uh, are uh, transforming the monuments, uh, uh, the next day, uh, we have an army of uh, people paid by the Sofia municipality or Plovdiv municipality to wash the, uh, diligently the, uh, the monuments. Um, and for the for the white for the young people, um, it's kind of a um, total. No, it's not an oblivion. Um, it is a rejection to to connect to this known memory because it, it first they. They, they know almost nothing about the communist period. And second, because there's nothing more invincible, uh, invisible than a monument like uh, Robert Musil said, uh, said once. Uh, and we'll see how this kind of uh, a non memory transforms into, um, uh, into a totally different uh, um, activism and uh, rejection of uh, the totalitarian uh, propaganda. Um, and let's see now some of the most notorious examples and I'll talk a little more about uh, all of them. Um, for the sake of historical uh, research, I divided the presentation in two uh, major uh, parts. One uh, deals with the monuments and uh, all the issues connected with them up until the 80s and then around the, the late 70s, 80s, we have, a, uh, from an aesthetic point of view, a shift into the representation of the body and uh, uh, some kind of timid attempt to have more modern and more abstract way of presenting the totalitarian <coughs> propaganda, but it's the same, absolutely the same idea, the same politics of memory, the same 
politics of imposing the cliches of the uh, of uh, the either the Red Army or the glorious uh, uh, Bulgarian history. Um, and on the top of those monuments are uh, always the, the same uh, heroes. Uh, the first such monument uh, uh, we can see today uh, in the middle of uh, one of the greatest Bulgarian uh, Sofia parks, um, the Brotherhood Mount. By the way, um, there are no, as I mentioned already, that there are no um, uh, Soviet soldier, soldiers that uh, um, fought on Bulgarian uh, land, um, and uh, some they committed some crimes in Bulgaria to the extent that Bulgarian communist leader uh, Georgi Dimitrov, who was still at the time in Moscow as a uh, president of the uh, Communist International, asked Stalin to stop to order his uh, generals, to order their soldiers in Bulgaria to stop commit, to, to commit uh, uh, rape and, uh, and robberies uh, around, uh, around Bulgaria. And they did stop. Some of them were actually uh, executed on the spot for because of drinking, because of some robberies, etc., etc. Those were the victims of, of the Red Army on Bulgarian soil. Once they started building the, uh, the, the monument that you just saw, um, there was some kind of the uh, Gumanus uh, Maximus here, uh, 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 a whole new ideological and architectural line that um, uh, uh, um, united the, the, the first monument with the monument of the Soviet army here and the tower of the headquarters of the Communist Party. Very few people know this new planning of, of, of the capital city. Here you, you see also the scale of, of those monuments and um, uh, the architect architectural and uh, uh, the aesthetic style. We see them in many places exactly the same. And here's the, because Bulgaria has this specific uh, March, 1st of March day. This is what happened last year in Sofia for to, to celebrate the 1st of March. Uh, the, the two symbols of, of the coming uh, uh, the, the coming uh, spring. <coughs> the monument of the Soviet army, uh, maybe um, this is the place where all the debates and uh, um, the, uh, the new happening, if you wish, uh, um, uh, are related to. Most of the young people sitting around the monument sit with their back to the monument. Uh, so you see the back of the monument, you see some of the uh, of those um, uh, side uh, uh, sculptural groups. Uh, they're related to the history of the Soviet Army, the Soviet Union, and the Bulgarian uh, Soviet um, uh, Brotherhood. Here you see the <clears throat> and. Uh, the heterotopic agenda of, of, uh, of the story here. Uh, we have young people that have their skateboarder boards around the monument. Um, we have uh, lots of techno and gay para parades around the, uh, around the monument. Very few people know exactly what is this sol uh, the soldier on the top and uh, the woman, nobody knows about her. We do neither. So this is how the whole story started to uh, uh, to become uh, the place where political activists and street artists immediately, uh, how to say, show and exhibit their um, uh, their reaction to different uh, uh, venues. Here is a piece in pace with time. Uh, actually, in 2011, this was the the first such big uh, uh, new paintings over over the the, uh, the heroes of the uh, of the soviet army um, immediately after the fall of communism the graffiti were um, more um, uh, actually uh, popular around around the monument and the, the most famous one of course and the one that i really loved was i do not want to be a soldier many years afterwards we get it uh, actually uh, 
<laughs> stopped the conscri conscription and, and uh, has a, uh, now a professional army. Um, a huge wave of uh, uh, pro-communist uh, protests started uh, against the vandalism of the graffiti, against those hooligans who were daring to, to be, uh, be sacred the, the monument. Now uh, we have a new wave of, uh, um, uh, I, would, I would say, much more coherent protests um, exhibited by uh, the heterotopic place of the, uh, of the monument of the Soviet army. Um, the, protest, the protest against Africa also um, uh, took place uh, to some extent around uh, uh, the monument of the, of the Soviet army. Very successful, by, by the way, in Bulgaria. Here we have the uh, Pussy Riot arrest, also part of the protest uh, um, of a couple of groups uh, of political activists uh, in Bulgaria. Um, I don't want to tell you how furious was the answer coming from the Russian embassy. Uh, the day of the commemoration of the victims of communism, I would say very timid kind of protest, but uh, at least it was um, simultaneously with almost non-existent commemoration of the victims of the uh, communist terror uh, in Bulgaria. This was in 2013. Uh, here is the... Uh, Bulgaria apologizes for the uh, Prague Spring anniversary in 2013. Prague newspapers were uh, full of this, those images at the time in August. Here we have uh, uh, some of the most uh, recent ones last year. Um, support for the Ukrainian revolution. Um, in other places also uh, monuments were painted with the, the colors of the uh, Ukrainian flag. Again, <coughs> you say to the Soviet army liberator from the uh, grateful Bulgarian people in every single so, uh, Russian uh, army monument. We have almost the same inscription, uh, regularly repainted with gold uh, uh, colors. Here is again Crimea 2014. Yeah. Same happened not only in Sofia but in Varna, uh, a specific monument from coming from the second uh, period of the, of the totalitarian uh, monumental propaganda. Um, the only monument called Sof uh, Bulgarian Soviet Friendship. I don't know of, of any other East European country where such a monument still exists, if ever was um, first uh, created. Uh, here is one again. Um, I mentioned uh, the name of uh, Sen Genov and another um, a little group of uh, street artists. Uh, they were actually put on trial for uh, painting the faces of uh, uh, the monument just in front of the headquarters of the Communist uh, Socialist Party in Bulgaria, illegally built on the uh, sidewalk. Uh, in Plovdiv, the second city in Bulgaria, we have this uh, uh, huge stone monument, dominates one of the hills of the city, same, almost same inscription. And this is what happened, the wrapping of Alyosha uh, uh, during the night of the museums. By the way, um, Alyosha was in the center of uh, heated debate about uh, um, the symbols of communism uh, uh, in uh, 1990, when Plovdiv was the place where the most uh, famous uh, uh, group of uh, avant-garde artists uh, was created. It was called Edge, Rub. And um, uh, the first artistic expression of total rejection of the symbols of the communist uh, regime. I remember that at the end of the uh, opening show for the exhibition, we were eating uh, a cake with uh, um, uh, hammer and uh, uh, sir, sir, uh, sickle. sickle. It was very difficult. <laughs> um, and the debate about uh, Alosha, uh, uh, the, the Soviet uh, uh, soldier on the top of the hill, was that, uh, well, we're going to uh, dismantle uh, the monument, but it's going to be extremely costly and very, very dangerous for uh, the center of the city. Then someone wanted to uh, ask uh, 
the most famous Bulgarian uh, avant-garde uh, artist Christo to come back to Plovdiv and to wrap the monument. Christo mm -hmm. never comes to Bulgaria, so uh, <laughs> we uh, simply forgot this idea. Then someone wanted to put some mirrors around. Anyway, my brother, who is uh, an artist from the same group, said, okay, I propose you that the easiest and the cheapest way we just uh, get away with his mm, hat and his, uh, and his uh, shpagin, his, the, the, the arm, and to put underneath a Loshe Karamazov. No one uh, actually smiled at the uh, city council because most probably they didn't know who is Aloshe Karamazov. And it didn't happen, of course. Anyway, but Aloshe is also um, a subject of validation by um, artists in uh, Um just, just to remind you what was the style and uh, the size and the humbleness of the real soldier monuments that were or that are uh, still all around Bulgaria um, in commemoration of the soldiers that uh, fought um, in 1877, 78 um, and liberated Bulgaria from the Ottoman Empire. There are just one um, uh, across uh, a, a small space uh, from each other at the top of the hill in Kutlov. Now we are going to the second uh, uh, period of the um, of the totalitarian uh, monumental propaganda. Uh, another um, mount of brotherhood uh, in Plovdiv this time. Um, the author is Lugomir Dalchev. He wrote. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I'll show you some of the. Uh, the this is the. Uh, the view from outside, 24 hours uh, uh, police surveillance, um, and this is what you can see inside now. Uh, very interesting case of combining um, the uh, Bulgarian National Revolutionary uh, period uh, and all the pantheon of the heroes from the 19th century with those who fought against uh, um, uh, the regime in Bulgaria uh, during the Second World War. It was an order coming from the Communist Party to combine the two periods of resistance. Uh, and I quote what was the uh, actually the, the argument for this very strange combination. Um, then uh, the head of the, of the local uh, party <coughs> council was a brother of a famous Bulgarian opera singer, Georg. And he said, um, to the uh, uh, to the major artists here who were Belgium. You should combine the heroes of Bulgaria because those who fought against the Ottoman yoke had leftist uh, ideas. This was the, um, uh, the argument to combine those uh, totally different and uh, um, uh, impossible to compare uh, parts of, uh, of uh, Bulgaria history uh, and to uh, create for the first time one symbolic place where all of them will be together. Here is what, what is left of the monument. And Dalchev asked for, for the removal of uh, most of the, of the sculptures that were um, connected to the second period of, of the, uh, the Second uh, World War. Uh, in almost every small town, even villages in Bulgaria, you can find the same kind of uh, muscular bodies uh, out of metal or stone um, with special elan in their, you know, the markers of, uh, uh, of the anti-fascist and uh, uh, pro-Soviet regime everywhere. We don't know exactly the, the resource that was put in, in this totalitarian uh, monumental propaganda. For sure, uh, there are millions of, of uh, a Bulgarian level paid by the Bulgarian citizens. Here is the, uh, the peak of this kind of commemoration. Um, uh, on the top of the Stara Planina mountain, where um, the beginning, uh, this, was, this is the place where the first socialist met in 1891 and created the Bulgarian Social, Socialist Democratic Party, which much later on, under the influence of the Bolshevik Revolution, became a communist party in 1919. 
um, in order to commemorate uh, uh, the event, um, the establishment built this um, monstrous monument, it's, it's maybe the biggest one in Bulgaria ever. Uh, this is how the major hall looked like. It was built to, to, for the uh, congresses of the, of the party. Um, huge part of the mosaics were uh, covered with uh, gold layer. Uh, and of course, you have the icons here. Tondo uh, Zhivkov, Bulgarian um, uh, party leader at the time, uh, with the founder of Bulgarian Communist Party, and Georgi Dimitrov, the one who begged Stalin to, uh, uh, to stop the Red Army uh, doing uh, what they did in Bulgaria. Uh, nothing is left. We'll see what happened uh, now. This is the, the hallway. Uh, this is how the monument looks like today. It's almost impossible to enter. <coughs> <laughs> this is the response for coming from young generations that can do everything with the internet. And and let, let's take a glance of uh, uh, another part of uh, the monumental propaganda. In, in uh, 1981, a massive uh, uh, movement, um, uh, of course, initiated by the state took place um, to celebrate the 13th century Bulgaria, uh, which was a little bit, um, uh, how to say, questionable, because out of those 13th centuries, seven um, Bulgaria did not exist as a separate state, as an independent state. Anyway, 1300 years Bulgaria was uh, um, uh, a huge event in Bulgaria, also uh, uh, crowned by uh, some uh, huge monuments. The one uh, in Schumann uh, 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 shows how, how the artistic vision changed a little bit and created another cliché of those huge, muscular, great uh, leaders of the Bulgarian, of the first Bulgarian state. You see how they look like. Uh, most of those monuments are falling apart now, and um, uh, the local municipality had to pay um, Mm, a lots of money to, to maintain at least to some extent the, the status quo of, of, uh, of the monuments. How do you like this? Uh, uh, the face of one of the most famous Bulgarian rulers of the first Bulgarian state. And finally, uh, in the middle of Sofia, we have uh, a monument called uh, 13th century Bulgaria, um, falling apart since the very beginning. Actually, um, on the eve of the opening of the monument in 1981, um, those marble or granite plaques were falling apart, so, so uh, at night uh, um, uh, the artists were um, painting some carton door to put it uh, in order to be ready for the for the opening um, and the reproduction I mean the, uh, the success uh, kind of um, accumulation of the same cliches that are related to the um, uh, that are taken from the Bulgarian historical mm -hmm. pantheon this is what's happening today and um, uh, the municipality last year uh, paid 800,000 leva for the restoration of the monument. Today, under tremendous pressure from the public opinion, they want to dismantle the, the monument. But the, art, the artist says no. And um, we don't know what's going to happen. The same, the same author who um, was um, uh, uh, who's the author of a bust of Brezhnev in front of the Sofia University. He doesn't claim because Brezhnev um, uh, appeared and disappeared overnight. And uh, he doesn't seem to remember that he is the one that also is the author of the Brezhnev monument. But for this one, he claims that uh, uh, the, the, um, 
not only him but uh, all the uh, people in his group in his team that the, this is the most modern uh, creative sophisticated and appealing monument ever built in bulgaria up until 1989. this is the consensus among the team of artists and, and architects that build the monument Uh, mm -hmm. the National Palace of Culture, uh, the monument that you have seen uh, a couple of seconds ago is just across the, uh, the park from uh, the National Palace of Culture. Again, all this uh, built to celebrate 13th century Bulgaria. And um, now let's see what is the, here. You, you see the, the monument of, that it's in ruin. Here is the National Palace of Culture in, in almost the same axis in the middle of, of the park uh, uh, in Sofia. Um, a very small chapel dedicated to the memory of the victims of communism. And you see uh, uh, here this cross uh, came as an anonymous donation um, somewhere from, uh, from around Breznik and this cross is as associated with the Bogomilism, with um, uh, the heresy that originated in Bulgaria in the 10th century and is considered to be a specific Bulgarian, uh, how to say, um, treasure, um, a tr kind of uh, legacy that uh, um, uh, is considered to be um, very, very crucial for the, uh, understanding Bulgarian. Uh, church and Bulgarian religious and uh, heretic tradition. So this is the chapel. Um, today still Tom Ruzhivko stands in full um, body in his native town of Pravets. Here we see uh, a notorious Bulgarian historian, professor of uh, history at the Sofia University. She is opening the monument of Todor Zhivkov, saying that he was the most capable politician who did everything possible uh, for the good of his own people, I quote. Here is his native uh, house, rebuilt, of course, and another bust of Todor in the middle of the park around. And finally, um, a totally unknown small humble monument um, at the end of the Sofia Cemetery where 148 people uh, were executed on the night of 1st of February 1945, the victims of the, of the so-called People's Tribunal. Um, most, uh, the, this was actually the political elite of Bulgaria. Prime ministers, ministers, deputies, uh, intellectuals, uh, all of them killed uh, in, uh, in one night. And, uh, through donations and some uh, sacrifices, uh, this small monument was built there. 100, almost 150 people in one huge uh, mass, mass grave. Sasha Sladura. Sasha Sladura was a violinist and uh, a joker. He was um, uh, a favorite to Sofia uh, public um, uh, in the late 40s and 50s. Um, he was going from one concert hall to another one, from one cabaret to another one. They were still not uh, totally annihilated uh, uh, yet. And one night he disappeared. Uh, he was taken to the concentration camp in Lovic. And after horrible, horrible, horrible torture, uh, he was killed 11, years, uh, 11 um, days after, after that. So uh, a very again uh, almost invisible for the for the general public uh, monument of Sasha Slodura um, on the, another hill in Plovdiv um, near the ancient theater. Maybe some of you know the uh, the Roman ancient theater in Plovdiv. So this is Sasha Slodura. Actually, he was taken there um, for uh, for uh, his very witty political jokes and uh, some of the former uh, cross elite uh, uh, officials loved his jokes but uh, he became more and more bitter and this was his punishment. Bulgaria closed uh, 
the concentration camp six years after after the Soviet Union, only in 1962. In, uh, uh, between 1959 and 1962, there were one more than 160 people killed with sticks and stones, like Sasha Sladura in the camp of, of uh, Lovic. Less than 1% of the people in Bulgaria, students coming from high school and entering the first year college, know that there were concentration camps in Bulgaria during communism. Less than 1%. I'm conducting the research of uh, uh, interviews every single year for 20 years. Less than 1% ever heard that there were such things as concentration camps during communism. The most recent poll in Bulgaria shows that uh, um, everyone knows what is Auschwitz. Uh, less than, I mean, I don't know even if we can measure this. Uh, um, some minuscule number of people knew what is Gulag. You, the usual um, answer given to the uh, to the question, uh, "Do you know what is Gulag?" is an internet search device. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Nikolai opened uh, the discussion today with some extremely important uh, questions, uh, but let me finish with the last of uh, my images and I'll, uh, I'll do my conclusion. Also, uh, also uh, the persecution of the, uh, of the church was terrible in Bulgaria, not only uh, Orthodox police, but, and not so much, but um, uh, um, the knife was <laughs> basically directed towards the, the Catholic and the Protestant uh, um, uh, church in, uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, one of the, those Catholic priests that was killed uh, on a, uh, after a mock trial. And now the changing of, uh, um, uh, of the style, the message, the idea, the sophistication, and the end of the, uh, of the totalitarian monumental propaganda comes with, uh, for me at least, with uh, um, this um, uh, small figure of uh, the town fool, again in my native Plovdiv. Um, uh, we remember this guy, he was uh, um, uh, present all the time on the Central sea, uh, Street. He knew by the name uh, the most beautiful ladies in, uh, in, in the city. And every Bulga Plovdiv painter, and it was a specific uh, uh, group of, uh, uh, of artists there, um, had Nido in. Uh, in uh, uh, the artwork that they produced, everyone, especially Zlatko Bojic, a famous Bulgarian uh, artist from from Plovdiv. Before, I remember when I, I was a small child, I won't tell exactly what age. A newlywed people were going to Alosha to um, to lay flowers there. It was a mandatory kind of ritual that newlywed people are going to claim with these terrible high heels, you know, to to Alosha to. Uh, to say thank you, my Communist Party. I just, uh, I'm just, I'm just married. Now, uh, uh, young people go and they they just touch Milo for uh, some kind of superstitious uh, search for luck. But uh, the change is over. I mean, uh, we do have a, a, um, a different approach now to um, to the city culture, and uh, I'm absolutely sure that uh, such thing as the um, totalitarian uh, uh, monumental propaganda is not going to happen anymore in, in Bulgaria. But at the same time, we have a severe persecution of street artists, political activists. They're um, threatened to be put in jail. We don't know what will be the, the, uh, the decision of, uh, of the court uh, now against uh, uh, those who uh, painted the uh, uh, the monument uh, uh, in front of the communist uh, socialist party headquarters, etc., etc. Plus, uh, in May 2000, uh, Bulgarian parliament did pass a law uh, that uh, clearly stated that the communist regime was a criminal one. Um, and another invisible, <laughs> totally secret law. Uh, it's a declaration. It has nothing to do, uh, unfortunately, with uh, any kind of. Uh, uh, public culture, public debate, uh, um, a change of the curriculum in, uh, in high school or universities. And the dominant dis discourse in Bulgaria today is um, uh, basically nostalgic and um, 
um, we're a champion in uh, poverty and nostalgia in uh, the European Union. Uh, this is why um, uh, the repainting of the, of the monuments for me is an extremely important uh, um, uh, symbolic act of the new generations uh, uh, to reject and to, um, to create a new uh, social and political milieu, if you, if you wish, a new forum for discussion about the recent past um, in Bulgaria. Last year, I started a petition to change the curricula and the, and the, and the textbooks in Bulgaria in order to, um, to have at least a at least, um, couple of, of uh, weeks dedicated to the study of communism in comparative um, uh, field. Uh, because no one teaches uh, history in Bulgaria today uh, after the First World War. Um, the, uh, the, no question uh, for the exam that uh, is required to finish high school, the so-called matura, has anything after after that period. Communism is totally non-existent, um, and the entrance exam to the university is also totally omitting the uh, uh, the, the very um, how to say hot questions about uh, about communism. Uh, the level of, uh, of uh, ignorance is um, striking. It's striking, and um, I, if it was just an ignorance, ignorance, to some extent you can find the reasons for, and see and say, okay, we can remedy this and this and this. Now the whole, how to say, citizens' uh, culture in Bulgaria uh, uh, suffers from the total lack of knowledge and discussion about what really was communism in Bulgaria, what is the legacy of communism in Bulgaria, how uh, we can uh, all the channels of discussion about the period were uh, actually uh, uh, cluttered and, and um, there was no real discussion, no, no academic discussion, no political discussion, no ideological discussion, no aesthetic discussion about what uh, um, all the remnants still, if you wish, the symbolic remnants of of communism uh, pre representing the uh, This is why um, uh, the, the topic of the monuments for me is so, so crucial, uh, because those are uh, the living symbols of, of uh, communism that still dominate uh, uh, the social space in some of the biggest Bulgarian uh, cities, like in, there's no other place uh, to compare. Um, and uh, like I mentioned already, we have a severe persecution against activist and, and political activist and uh, street um, uh, uh, painters, street artists. Um, the whole story could also be used to uh, to judge the quality of democracy in Bulgaria 25 years after the first world. Thank you for, for your attention and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here. Before we, I want to just make one last note to do with uh, the younger generation of digital media, uh, because that's kind of my thing. And then we go and drink some wine. Um, what's really important is because um, this this topic is is um, okay. I, I can do two things at once. So just one second. Okay, if you have any questions for me, um, without wine or with wine, <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you for your, mm, sorry, thank you for the wonderful insights, Bobo. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any proposition what to do with those uh, monuments? Because I think destruction of them is also the question. I mean, this is art, after all. So, what do you think we need to do with those? Things? Well, there are m many different voices here. Um, I certainly think that some of them should be dismantled and put in some kind of sculpture park or something like this. Um, for me, aesthetically, it's an insult, but uh, I'm, this is my private, uh, uh, private opinion. On the other, uh, on the other end, <coughs> uh, well, and I, I would say that uh, uh, now with transforming those uh, spaces uh, in this heterotopic way into um, a place for a very active and very, uh, um, I would say, appealing um, new. Uh, uh, platform for uh, to exhibit uh, uh, basically and to to post uh, uh, protest and political views. 
uh, they're also important to stay uh, at the same place. So I cannot give you a straight answer about it. What I think should happen is a total change into uh, the curriculum and uh, opening a real debate about uh, uh, about uh, the whole the whole recent past of, of Bulgaria. But again, I, I do believe that uh, uh, some of the political decisions, some of the constellation of the political power in Bulgaria, some of the new um, tremendously, uh, uh, um, how to say, uh, low quality populist formations in Bulgaria, most of them uh, far left, not far right, like, like they want to represent, uh, uh, the communist uh, socialists present them. Um, xenophobic, um, uh, chauvinistic, uh, um, etc., etc. Uh, um, they um, they insist on the untouchable, glorious past of communism, and their agenda um, actually succeeded. And the voices of those who would like to um, to initiate the debate are very, very, very weak. Very weak. I just wanted to. With connection to this question, uh, this is the monument, the 1,300 years that Professor Gebetsova mentioned uh, earlier. And recently, there was a change of government, and one of the first things that they kind of decided to do was to demolish it. It was a very powerful kind of, you know, move away from the previous government, which was very pro-Soviet and very pro-Russia. And what happened, which was very unexpected, is that there was a strong backlash by people who were from my generation who started a an online campaign. Uh, that they, they was totally opposed to this demolition, and as you can see, their their main kind of thing that they're trying to push forward is that you can't bury history. The question, and I think it was shown very well during this lecture, is which history are we talking about? What kind of a burial is it? Now, when when the protests happened and there was so much attention paid on the Soviet mo army monument, my question was why why are people going to this monument to express solidarity for Ukraine? Where is the public kind of discussion going? Why is it there? Is it so stifled that you can't really do it anywhere else? Um, and it turned out that no, no, you can't. Uh, you have to really, you're pushed so far that you have to go to these radical artistic expression in order to say something that should be rather obvious. Um, and what, what, what this shows is that if they're not to be demolished, uh, I don't know about how, whether they're art or not. I don't think so. But their place is now becoming a debate for younger people and people are taking to social media to discuss their their place and, and their role and as you can see they're inspiring a certain kind of design and a certain aesthetic and as i showed you in the beginning with that monster despite the fact that people are unaware of the very concrete totalitarian history uh, they're starting to be reseen they're not just banal just unseen, regular, everyday things. And that's why it's so important to combine the two things, what, what Professor Kielbetschow is saying about really understanding the history and really coming to terms with the very specific politics of memory. And then, you know, that should be the first step so that the second step could be a really knowledgeable um, discussion about where their place is today, whether to be demolished and put in a, in a, in a museum or whether they should be left in order to inspire some artistic uh, or political protest. But, uh, that, that's all I wanted to say, and if you, if you have and any the more... the position is, is here to have a huge hole to bury the monument, right? Right. Well, I think the point is to say that if, if you demolish it, you're just burying something that was... I would bury it... Uh, uh, but so would I, but I mean, uh, the, the idea is that, you know, for once, even something that's so contentious, there's an actual debate in the public realm forming in Bulgaria, which is, you know, something that I'm at least a little bit happy about. Uh, but if you have any more questions, please. Yes. Right. Um, so yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, so, okay, we have this uh, idea that, that there's a certain amnesia about the, the period of the, um, the communist rule in Bulgaria. Um, now, there's a, an, an American anthropologist, Kristen Godsey, who's recently written a book called The Left Side of History. So the premise of the book the, is that there's actually the left side of history that, that cannot um, be intellectually remembered anymore. Uh, do you think that there's a, a, a danger that, that somehow in, uh, 
in, in, in actually swinging from the former um, authoritarian communist version of history towards uh, a very anti-communist version of history, that we could possibly lose the, the nuances. For example, that people might start to imagine that the 90s and 20s in Bulgaria, the, the 20s and 30s, was perhaps some kind of democratic paradise. When, when generally speaking, we, we would have called these regimes authoritarian yeah. But, but right wing authoritarian. No, states. no one, uh, it's not, it's beyond uh, any discussion that uh, um, Bulgaria, as many other uh, Eastern European, European countries, uh, went through authoritarian regimes, uh, regime uh, in the 30s, in the beginning of the 40s. There's no doubt about it. No one discusses anymore. I mean, this is beyond any kind of uh, discussion. I, I am not. Um, uh, I think your your question is very very uh, timely and good, uh, and uh, I have the answer immediately. Uh, uh, I think that uh, we're not talking about memory here; we're talking about knowledge. Um, uh, there is no knowledge about what happened in Bulgaria between 1944 and 1989 in terms of curricula, textbooks, uh, debates, discussion, etc. We need, uh, uh, if you, of course, if we're permitted to to, uh, to create modern textbooks now, both for high school and for the university, uh, of course there'll be a historiographical approach with uh, different uh, points of view, and uh, um, and there are such uh, highly scholarly uh, texts, but uh, they do not influence uh, uh, the public knowledge. And as you see, uh, nothing like uh, the monstrous totalitarian monumental propaganda can happen again in in, uh, in Bulgaria. No, it's totally, um, I would say, spontaneously rejected by uh, uh, by both generations that suffered, uh, at least, and those that were real victims of communism, and those that are now uh, doing the monuments, if you wish. Um, and it's a it's a good um, a good sign. So there, there will be no, I, I, as I read your question, maybe you're afraid that another wave of uh, kind of uh, uh, anti-communist propaganda is going to create uh, such monsters in Bulgaria. No, no, it's, it's, it's over, thank God. And the debate is much more multi-voiced and, uh, and um, sophisticated uh, when it is, there is a debate. But uh, we're talking about not about memory. We're talking about uh, lack of, of, of knowledge and lack of, uh, of uh, scholarly approaches for this. Well, you can also counter the, this uh, discussion with uh, a date 1972, when for the first time Holocaust became part of the curriculum in Germany. 1972. When I learned this, I was almost shocked. So. 25 years are enough to to uh, to go back and to to have a <coughs> clear and sober and uh, uh, I would say mm, tamed discussion on uh, what we know what was stopped of being knowledge and what was totally falsified about uh, about this history but the soviet army is obviously a fake I mean, this is something that cannot be tolerated uh, in terms of, of the inscription of those monuments and their status uh, as soldiers money. Any other questions? Yep. How come is it that the um, the monuments depicting soldiers are so uh, still so adamantly protected by the authorities, and yet uh, the other ones that are of more of a kind of architectural, uh, spatial quality are left to ruin, like that uh, UFO one? <laughs> they don't protect the camera. Well, they're unprotectable, but they're <laughs> built in such a hurry um, from the campaign that was initiated by the party that, uh, um, and the quality was very, 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 very bad. Uh, no, they're all protected by, uh, by the establishment. There, like I mentioned, enormous amount of money is put every year in, in uh, trying to, to, to uh, maintain the, those qualities. Both, both the fake. Uh, soldiers monument of the Soviet army and uh, the new ones, the more modern style. Uh, but they're mostly related to the uh, Bulgarian uh, celebration of the 13th century. 
they're not anymore uh, Soviet animals. Yeah. Hi, I was. Uh, um, thank you for your talk. I was a little bit late, so I didn't catch the beginning. I, uh, and I'm not sure whether you mentioned the Zhushkov mausoleum in, in Sofia, uh, which, with regard to the to, to the quality, wasn't there the sort of notion that the the sort of surprise as to how solid and how good the quality effectively of this mausoleum was, because it took sort of several attempts and hundreds of kilograms of dynamite to to destroy. So it might be a little more difficult to destroy. Or to bury this past, indeed, is that first the suggested than uh, that actually uh, often happens in practice. But my sort of question is, uh, I suppose, connected to, to, to these goings on outside the Red Army Monument in in um, in Sofia, which for me is very interesting. As I'm from Poland and I, I work on Warsaw, and there the Red Army Monuments tend to be fair that there, there's there's still a reverence towards them. But the official politics of memory is much more critical towards uh, the communist past. So there's a weird sort of contrast between between mm -hmm. those two things. The idea of the monuments are taken down, as actually happened recently in Warsaw, yeah. to one such monument, or they are they are protected, and there is a sort of level of, of, of reverence which is attached to them. Uh, in contrast to the to the sort of communist baiting, which is a constant feature of, of public discourse. But it's interesting to to me, sort of what Nikolai was saying just now. That there is these uh, also remind me to some extent of what happened in Ukraine just now, where the, the Stalinist sort of totalitarian spaces were functioning sort of as uh, as, as kind of kinds of sort of agoras, places where the sort of the, the sort of public uh, democratic discussions are violent or not happened. And it seems to be that, in a sense, from what you're saying now, the, the only place where democracy can happen on the street in Bulgaria is this most sort of obvious material legacy of, of totalitarianism. So is there not perhaps something sort of inherently public and democratic about these, about these monuments? And isn't that a, an argument for keeping them there and using them as a tool in, in, in the curriculum creation rather than knocking them down? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is not the only place, uh, but certainly this is the new place. Uh, and it seems to me that it's a cry to say, we don't have any other place so obvious, so open, so public, so huge, so, if you wish, visible to, to express our, uh, our new, say, protest or our opinions about what happens in Crimea or why Bulgaria did not apologize for being part of the invasion in Czechoslovakia, which is not Bulgaria did apologize officially. But, I mean, uh, remembering uh, the, uh, those stories, um, well, again, uh, I think that uh, um, um, the, this vivid carnivalization is beautiful and it does teach uh, certain part of the, uh, say, the city uh, public into something. But we need something much more radical and much more uh, profound to, to change this uh, total asymmetry of, uh, of the knowledge about uh, what uh, communism was and uh, <coughs> Uh, because we do know for 70 years what happened under authoritarian regimes, what happened to um, anti uh, to communist resistance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, what we uh, what we know about communism is uh, close to the uh, to the zero. Now I start thinking that uh, maybe uh, one or two monuments should remain in order to to be uh, this tribune for uh, young people to do it there to for them to do it their own way. They know what the media will be to, um, uh, to connect to, uh, to young generations. Not so much lectures or uh, boring history lessons, right, Vasco? <laughs> yes. I, and the, the, uh, I, didn't, I decided to, not to talk about the mausoleum in Sofia. Uh, first, because, as you know, this, Sofia was the most Western capital where there was a mausoleum. There was one in Pyongyang, one in uh, um, uh, Beijing, one, uh, what else? There was no mausoleums west, uh, yes, west, yes, uh, west than, than Sofia and... Of course, of course, I don't open a Pandora box now. <laughs> but uh, sure, sure, and uh, um, True, uh, another, uh, another paradox that I didn't have time to, to talk uh, too much about is that the most 
uh, well-known, well-established and talented uh, architects, engineers and, and um, uh, painters in, in Bulgaria actually were forced to, to work on, on, on those monuments. Um, and uh, uh, most of them actually graduated in some of the best schools of architecture and arts in, in Germany. Yeah, so yeah. they they were quite familiar with uh, uh, with the totalitarian style, if you wish, and they they did a, a great job. Now it's impossible to to actually to blow the, the those monuments, and the mon the mausoleum also it should be turned into a uh, um, kind of uh, Madame Truffaut, uh, Madame uh, Tis Tis uh, Tis uh, Tis uh, Sorry, <laughs> but, but um, if um, I may, museum. Uh, just let me finish, oh, sorry. excuse me, um, to, into some kind of, uh, um, say, um, history of, contempo of um, communist Bulgaria or something like this, or a history of, uh, of mock, or mock history of, of the period. Certainly I was against the, the blowing of the, of the mausoleum. Yeah, sorry. With, with young people, even though it's blown away, uh, especially with the, with the first, I, I think you missed it, uh, there's an online campaign with like drawing monsters on these things. And the girl who's my age said, you know, I'm quite nostalgic about this uh, mausoleum. And now it's just, there's nothing there. And um, young people still know about it. So it's quite actually anticlimactic that they blew it away because it's actually drawn more interest uh, by the young people. And when the protests happened, that was the main place where the protests gathered. And when I asked people, do you know where the Red Star was? Do you know where the mausoleum was? And they were kind of like, a little bit shamefully, they were like, no, not really. Mm -hmm. So from that from that point of view, because they're places of democracy and because they're the only places, it shows how, you know, the, the, the hidden kind of continual totalitarian politics continues to work today. So when you blow them away, mm -hmm. they just continue to work in the same way, just they're not For physically there. For a small, there. very small portion of, it, of the young Can people. I just say another thing, yeah. I mean, just briefly about this, about this, the quality of some of the monuments. I mean, the slides you were showing, the, the, the level of, of workmanship and detail and, and innovation in many of these monuments that are either destroyed or, or not yet destroyed or chipped, chipped away, as this one is very high, and there is a real beauty to them. Compared to these statues of people sitting on benches, which is this kind of global curse now, where every, every sort of every westernized zone has like a local folk hero sitting on the bench. I mean, the, these, which I mean, I think should be banned by a totalitarian <laughs> decree. The, 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 the level of, 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 uh, of creativity in these monuments is much higher, and that perhaps is... You like the, the, the totalitarian uh, yeah, monumental they're they're, style? Yeah, they're monstrous in their own way. Of course, they're, I mean, yeah, incredibly sort of... Uh, okay, I'm not normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if there's one thing you showed, I mean, of these weird sort of video game 13th century national heroes, and this is pretty, it's completely crazy, but it's, but it's totally, you know, it's, it has a, an incredibly high value of its own. True, true. Um, this was, this is, was the exception. Um, and the guy, like I said, uh, became a political refugee to the United States and uh, wrote a, a, a letter to the authorities in Bulgaria and said, uh, please destroy everything I did uh, in the Soviet army monument and keep some, only few of those, the, the modern stuff that you, you, you've seen. I agree. And he said, I, I'm, if I'm ashamed of anything, I'm ashamed that I was part of the team working on the uh, uh, Red Army monument. Yeah, so they, they were highly critical about what they were forced to do because I couldn't imagine that they'll say, I'm not working on this and they won't uh, end up in concentration camp. And it was in the, in the beginning of the 50s. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's. There Maybe was a question, question, there. question there. Okay. Um, thank you. I have three things that were great. Yes. Um, firstly, you know, the inscriptions by the grateful Bulgarian people. Surely there is a part of the population who feels, feels that way it's exemplified in the protests, counter protests, in the past few years. Um, what do we do with the views of those people? Do we just simply disregard them as levels of our own? And secondly, I think that we still have to teach them what re really happened. Okay. I'm not going to kill them for sure. Send me those were activists and street artists, you know, people going to the monument and spraying them and painting them. What example 
to reset. So, so our community, a country we always talk about holding on to accountability. What example do we set when a potential MP goes and does this in an election campaign? That's my second point. And finally, um, you know, you talk of the change in in propaganda, but it's it's, it's no longer there. I would just like to point to Murat calling one of the main stations at the Metro the European Union. And how do we feel about that? Do we name it after an existing political project or do we name it after a hero that we, we all agree on is someone that can be a better name to us? Well, for sure, I prefer to be European Union than the Red Army Monument. Mm. But um, uh, those names are given uh, by chance and no consensus and no discussion. So uh, it's part of the municipality council. Uh, I don't think it, it's uh, it's crucial at all. Um, but uh, uh, the, I do have a problem with the inscription to the um, uh, to the Red Army Liberator from the Grateful Bulgarian people. Because it is a falsification of history. And education is the only way. And, and a, a huge public debate on, on, the, um, on the issue. This is my, that, my answer. <coughs> well, um, I, um, I mentioned that there's a, there is a law in Bulgaria stating that the communist regime was, was criminal explicitly or implicitly uh, it should have much more um, uh, impact on Bulgarian society than actually uh, it had and has. Um, so to persecute people for spraying uh, uh, the monument uh, it's, um, it's ridiculous for me. To, to, to uh, try to, to force people to pay enormous amount of money to uh, to wash the monuments and to have 24-hour video uh, surveillance and a uh, huge amount of policemen around them, it's also ridiculous. I think that if we want to feel the freedom, we have to have, a, uh, if you wish, an open space where um, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate uh, political views and especially to contest what, uh, what is the message of, of, uh, of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, especially this statement, this symbolic statement of, um, about Soviet art. It has nothing to do with other soldiers' monuments. Yeah? Um, I'm uh, originally from Bulgaria. Um, your lecture was, your presentation was in one But while listening to you, I um, thought about the um, um, the other arts, like uh, cinema, music, uh, because they all, from that period, they all uh, uh, praised uh, this totalitarian state. And uh, the um, big army of uh, intellectuals uh, were paid by the state to praise the state through this, uh, not only monument, but music, uh, also uh, cinema. And uh, historians, a big army of historians who created this totalitarian state. Um, I'm, I studied also at Sofia University, and I know that the people from that period, uh, historians uh, included, um, they uh, uh, are now professors. Yes. I wonder to what extent your colleagues in the academia admitted their responsibility for what they uh, pray did during totalitarian period and uh, to what extent they are apologetic because uh, uh, at the end of the day it's uh, the responsibility of uh, people like you yes 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 um, <coughs> this is why i'm talking about education so much uh, some of the um, of the most i would say well-established uh, uh, part of the, his of hi the history community, history-making community in Bulgaria, um, had un uninterrupted great careers and they're still now in charge with uh, education and publications. Uh, four of the figures of the most important uh, um, institutions dealing with history, the 
Institute of History at Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, the History Department at the Sofia University, the National Museum, um, uh, the National Historical Museum, and, and the fourth one, uh, and the, uh, the National Archives now, basically, um, are leaded by, by the, uh, agents of the, of the secret police. Today, today, their files are open. We know that there were um, agents of the secret police, and they're still in charge with, um, uh, with the most uh, important, crucial, I would say, educational and history um, uh, proliferating knowledge uh, institutions in Bulgaria. What can I say more about? Without illustration, uh, this is what uh, uh, a very democratic uh, um, state now is doing with uh, people who are still in charge with uh, educating the young generations about about communism. And I show this, uh, um, it, it is a public knowledge about uh, one of the leading historians of the Sofia University, um, uh, opening the monument of uh, Todor Zhivkov with an uh, incredibly ap apologetic uh, speech. No one single even question about uh, a nuance uh, about the accomplishment <coughs> and the uh, discussion about uh, his legacy and, the, and communism. So unfortunately, we are not. Uh, we have a huge role to play. I don't know whether. Um, I think that's going to be. We can continue this informally yes. over a glass of wine on this incredibly, you know, wonderful note on the secret police. But I, I'm getting notes from the establishment here yeah. that it's <laughs> time to end it. So if you make your way to the Masaryk room, there's. Let's the phone idea, and we will have a small reception. So please join us.